So good afternoon, everybody. And if you're joining us from the US today live, a good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Ian Mosley. Thank you for joining us today. This is webinar number 11 of our Powerful Knowledge series. And today, Jose Gonzalez from Warwick will be presenting um, some interesting topics all about packaging of semiconductors. I'm just going to do a very brief introduction today. So um, if you've joined us on the webinar series before, you'll know roughly how this all works. Um, once we've uh, finished this webinar, it will be available on demand. Um, if you've already registered, you should have the link for that. And all of our prior webinars, so uh, the first 10 are now available on our website as well. Uh, and I'll put the links in the chat box today in case you want to access those. Um, this is not um, number 11 of our webinar series. So just briefly to give you an idea what we've covered so far, we've, um, we've been through AC to DC and DC to AC conversion. DC to DC conversion, power semiconductors, silicon carbide power MOSFETs, um, some gate drive design um, details. Uh, Jose did a great job on power device reliability, silicon carbide reliability, and gate oxide threshold instabilities. In the last couple of weeks, uh, or the last week or so, I've been talking about um, um, magnetic design, both from a, an equation perspective and from finite element uh, approaches. So we've covered a fair range of stuff already. We're about halfway through. Um, in the next few weeks, we're going to be moving on to things like simulation, uh, thermal management. Jose will be talking about condition monitoring in, in power semiconductor devices. And we'll, we'll move into reliability modeling and a few other bits and pieces as well. So thank you for joining us today. Um, as I say, this webinar will be about one hour long or just under, and we'll have a question session at the end. On the right-hand side of your screen, if you've been uh, joined us before, you'll see that there's a chat box. So if you have any technical issues during the webinar, please put your um, request into the chat box, and I'll, I'll try and deal with those whilst Jose is presenting. Um, we'd love it if you can ask, if there's any technical questions on the content of what we're talking about today, please put those in the questions box, and we'll spend some time at the end uh, discussing those points and hopefully answering those as best we're able to. And also, I'll be launching some polls that Jose has put together um, for this webinar, just to get, give us a feeling of the sort of background um, that you, the audience, uh, um, are interested in. So it helps us to prepare our content better for the future. So with that, I think I will hand over now to Jose and uh, leave you in his very capable hands. Thank you, Jose. Hi, Ian. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to present this time is power electronics packaging. It's a bit different to what I presented. So I hope that you enjoy what I'm about to present. So I hope that you can see the slides now. So this is packaging of power semiconductors. Pointer options. So this is the webinar part of the Powerful Knowledge webinar series. So let's start. So this is just the outline of the presentation. So it's just mainly an introduction. I'm going to review a bit of the packaging fundamentals. Then let's do a general overview of silicon carbide compared with silicon regarding packaging. And we do a bit on power cycling and packaging degradation, and we conclude the presentation. So let's start with what we have evaluated so far. So far, so we know that silicon carbide is a brilliant material. So it enables high voltage devices that can switch at higher frequencies, and they can operate at high temperature. And we just manufacture devices using silicon carbide. So we define our structure. We understand what happens with the gate oxide. We understand all the parasitic channel resistances, role of the gate voltage, and reliability from the device perspective. Now we fabricate our device and we have to package this device. We want to use it in the application. So in the application, power devices, they have to conduct high currents. They have to block high voltages. Hence, they dissipate high powers. So. What are the main objectives of packaging a power device? So you want that device, the package to have good electrical conduction. It requires good electrical insulation, good heat conduction, and mechanical robustness. So your device is going to get hot. So you want to be able to remove that heat. You want to 
you are going to have high voltages, you want to be able to isolate, you don't want problems with insulation and that stuff. Also, you want a good mechanical robustness because you want your package to be robust, you, want your you don't want your package to break easily. So there are different packaging methods, and that's also because of the different current and voltage ratings. So you have current ratings that go from several amps to kiloamps, so you may have a discrete TO247 to a press pack capsule of several thousand amps, and also voltage ranging, ranging from just 100 volts or less to several kilovolts. So that makes tricks on the package. If you want to operate at dieseling voltages of five, six, seven, eight thousand volts, you have to make these groups to keep the clearance and creepage distances. So there are different things that you have to manage when you want to operate at several kilovolts. It's important that the devices are going to be subjected to electrothermal and thermomechanical stresses. Hence, reliability and robustness are key regarding packaging. So packaging, you may have discrete transistors, discrete diodes, just packaging a TO247, TO220. You may have hull bridge modules, like the one in this figure. It's just a converter leg, just one phase. You may have six pack modules, just with the three phase, six devices, and probably also some diodes. And some people know they are manufacturers, they are moving into intelligent power modules, like the one shown here, it's just like a converter in package where you have gate drivers, sensors, and different stuff added to just having only the power devices. So I have a question now, that is that I would like to check what kind of power electronic devices do you use? So Ian, if you can launch the question. Okay, I've launched it. Okay, thanks. So let's start with discrete power devices. Discrete power devices we have traditional TO220, TO247, as you can see here. And also we have some SMD devices, the TO263, D2PAC. So this is the probably the most common power device that you will have seen and probably the one that you have worked with. So they are wire bonded devices. So you just have your chip, silicon, silicon carpet chip that is attached to a copper lead frame. And you use bond wires to connect the chip to the leads of the package. So then you just solder your device to the PCB and depending on that you will have the length of the lead or stand. So if you open the device you can see inside that you have the chip and the wire bonds for making electrical connection be between the chips. In this case you have a pin diode and the IGBT. So you have different wire bonds for having electrical connection. And then you have multiple wire bonds that's for increasing the current capability with different stitches. So that's just for having good current distribution in the chip. Now power modules. So starting from the first isolated power module that was released in 1974 to the latest power modules, let's see 2015, this IGBT module from Semicron. So you can see that the structure is similar, same kind of connection, same kind of ceramic substrate and base plate. So it looks like that this method of packaging methodology has been successful and has been with us for a long time. So it looks like that this methodology that was developed for silicon devices has been successful and has been adopted and even has been applied to silicon carbide devices. So what's the internal structure of this traditional power module? So you can see here uh, the internal structure of a module where they have re removed the plastic package and they also remove the insulating gel. And you can see that you have semiconductor chips. Here, in this case, this is just a half bridge. So you have an IGBT and a diode. It's important that the chips, depending on the way of interconnection, they require different top and bottom metallization. So if you're going to use aluminum wire bonds, you require a aluminum top, which is bondable. And you also require a soldable bottom that is that you can attach to your TVC. 
the TBC is just a ceramic substrate with layers of copper. So you have different patterns to have your power circuit, as you can see here. So you connect the gate part, you may have even temperature sensors somewhere, not sure if that's there. You also have the output terminals, then wire bonds that are used for connecting the chips and the ceramic substrate, the, the copper patterns on the ceramic substrate. And these wire bonds are usually aluminum. So, and then the base plate. Base plate is usually an alloy, ALSIC. So it has good thermal conductivity with thermal properties. Also can be copper in some models. So that's what the uh, power module looks like inside. Nevertheless, it has been, there are different studies that they have identified the weak elements of this packaging, which are mainly the solder materials and the wire bonds. So the wire bonds is just for interconnecting chips and the chip to the copper areas of the patterns on the substrate. And you have solder to attach the chips to the copper. And you also have co uh, solder to attach the DVC substrate to the base plate. So these are the weak elements of the packaging system. Regarding the solder, the failure mechanisms are solder to lamination and voids. So you can see in this figure cracks on the DVC to base plate solder attached. So you can see the cracks there. And also you can use scanning acoustic microscope or you can see or X-ray and you can see also the voids on the substrate, you can also see some voids in the edge, in the solder below the chips. So these are mainly the failure mechanisms regarding solder. Then wire bonds, usually the failure mechanisms are heel cracks and wire bond lift off. So I have some open access papers here where you can see the failure mechanisms. So they start with cracks on the attach of the wire bond to the chip or to the DVC copper substrate. And then as you uh, increase the number of cycles, you can see how at the beginning you have a good attachment of the wire bond to the aluminum pad. And then you start having cracks. And then there's a moment when the aluminum wire is just attached. So that's what it's called wire bond lift off. Novel devices, uh, they also require novel packaging structures. That's a key feature of gun hems. They are lateral devices and non-conventional packaging structures can be used in some cases. So I have here a picture of two gun hems. So some PCBs that we designed for testing them. And in one case, you have a SND package with a metal tab on top. That's just for thermal management. And you have here another device that is quite small. It's SMD as well. So the gate parts are on the bottom side of the chip. So you can see this structure. There's, there are no wire bonds. There are no solder within the chip. There's a video on YouTube that you could check the internal structure of this package. So your search can systems structure on YouTube. You could see a how they manufacture this package, how they have internal bias to connect the chip to the copper, su copper substrates on top and the bottom. And copper pilers, low inductance, that's key because these are very fast devices. Also, cash codes. I like to consider cash code like a package trick. So you have a normally on device with a low voltage silicon MOSFET in cash code configuration. So you have a silicon carbide JFET in the case of the silicon carbide cash code, which is in cash code configuration with a low voltage silicon MOSFET. And from outside the package, you just have access to the gate, drain, and source terminals. So you can see the structure here. So you just have the JFET, which is attached to the copper LED frame. And then you have the silicon MOSFET that is not directly attached to the copper LED frame. So you have to remember that they are lateral device, lateral, ver uh, vertical devices, sorry. So the bottom of the chip is attached, is connected to the drain. So you don't want two drains connected. So you're using a DBC to 
isolate both chips regarding the copper LED frame and then wire bonds just to connect the chips. It's important to mention that in the case of the silicon carbide cash code, the pin out is gate drain source and in the case of the gun cash code is gate source drain. So this may affect your design so you have a PCB or something that you just want to replace the chips and just connect the discrete device there you may have to rearrange your routing. So this concludes the introduction. Let's analyze a bit of packaging fundamentals now. So key of packaging is that the electrical characteristics is that the packaging should not affect the electrical characteristics of the device. So you want to have your device as you manufacture it. So you want to check that there is no additional resistances, there is no additional capacitances or inductances that will affect your switching transients. For uh, analyzing the parasitic resistance, so you can see here, this is like a kind of package where you will have your chip. And then this is the point where you can have access externally to the package. So there's going to be some additional parasitic resistance between the drain and the real drain, the output drain, and the same with the source. So this will cause additional losses, and this is highly relevant in high current modules where the chip resistance or high current devices where the chip resistance can be similar to the parasitic packaging resistance. Just imagine that some devices are 10 milliohms. If you have 2 milliohms, 1, 2 milliohms parasitic resistance, you are probably talking about 20% losses just on the parasitic elements of the packaging. What happens now with the other parasitic elements, so what which affect the switching transients. So these are mainly caused by packaging and circuit in, in circuit interconnections. And let's analyze uh, conventional double pulse test circuit, and we can see the elements there. So if you just have the parasitic capacitances and inductances. You have the parasitic capacitance of the frequent diode, the parasitic capacitance of the inductor, the parasitic inductance of the gate loop. It is also packaging and circuit interconnections, the parasitic source inductance and the parasitic power loop inductance. And also should be here probably the internal gate resistance depending on the device and the parasitic capacitances of the MOSFET itself. So now here you have inductances, capacitance, so you're going to have ringing resonance and let's analyze how they happen. So the parasitic gate loop inductance will resonate with the input capacitance of the device and you are going to have oscillations in the gate voltage. So there's a nice thesis, master's thesis here that you can check different studies regarding the value of the parasitic elements and you can see that. Then you have the power loop inductance. It causes ringing during the switching transients. So during turn on, you have resonance between the power loop inductance and the parasitic capacitances of the inductor and the diode. And during turn off, you have resonance between the power loop inductance and the output capacitance of the MOSFET. So this is going to, to cause overshoots, ringing on your transients, and this is going to have to cause issues of EMI, additional losses. You can also check the, the same thesis on this document is a tutorial. You could check how they analyze the role of the different values for the parasitic elements. Also, these additional capacitances, the charging of the parasitic capacitances of the diode and the inductor contributes to the current overshoot during turn on. So that's additional losses. So you can check how this was characterized in this these in this two master thesis and these two master thesis. So something that I would like to highlight and remark is the impact of the source inductance. And this is highly relevant regarding switching transients. So if you have a voltage drop across the source inductance, this will affect your effective gate source voltage. And this will affect your switching transients. So let's analyze what's the role of the source inductance. I just have a basic circuit here. So assuming that this is your applied gate pulse, so you want the gate driver voltage to be applied to your gate. However, there's a drop on the source inductance during turn on, and this drop is caused by the switching rate of the current. As you start having current here, flowing through this loop, 
you're going to have a voltage drop across the source inductance. So your effective gate voltage is going to be the gate driver voltage minus the voltage drop across the source inductance. Now, some people are working into minimizing this effect. So they are moving into three pings, moving from three ping devices to four ping discrete devices where do you ha they have an additional Kelvin source. So if you check, you have gate drain source, or now you have drain source, you have the power loop, and then you have the Kelvin source and the gate. So it's like connecting this directly in this point. So you just connect the, you have a Kelvin source here. So you are applying directly your gate driver voltage to your gate. So you have the impact of the source inductance and you can improve the losses and switching speed. Also, you have parasitic capacitances. In this case, let's see, analyze the TBC substrate. And this is similar to capacitive coupling and isolation of gate drivers. So let's assume that you have just two copper plates, copper areas, as on the DBC substrate, and you have a ceramic insulating, insulating layer, so that's a capacitor. Let's assume now that your base plate is connected to ground, and the top side is just connected to the output of your converter. So that's going to oscillate between the DC link and, and ground, so you're going to be charging and discharging this capacitor. If you're charging and discharging this capacitor with a fast TBDT, you're going to have current going through your through your TBC, or even if it's a PCB, or that's why you don't want parasitic capacitances in these kind of substrates. So it's similar to the bearing current in motors, or so capacitive coupling currents. Let's analyze now the materials in detail. So go back, going back to the traditional power module structure. We have different packaging materials in direct contact with different coefficients of thermal expansion and thermal conductivities. So you may have a mo power module with a base plate or power module without base plates, depending on the structure. So let's see what's the structure. So you have the semiconductor chips, it can be silicon, silicon carbide. You have the chip solder, there are different materials. It can be just traditional lead free sol solder, it can be sinter. Sint silver, sintered silver, there's different alternatives. Then you have your DVC, that is just a layers of copper attached to a ceramic insulation. It can be aluminum oxide, it can be aluminum nitride. There are different ceramics. Then you have the substrate solder, that is for attaching the DVC to the base plate. It's namely, can be made of alsic alloy. And then you have a thermal interface material to attach your base plate to your heat sink. In the case of the power module without a base plate, it's the same, but you don't have the addition of the base plate. It's just the DBC connected to your heat sink. So you have a question now. Question number two. So is that you work on packaging? So I mentioned that there are different packaging materials. I really like this figure. So you can see different packaging materials with different coefficients of thermal expansion and the thermal conductivity. So you can see aluminum, silver, copper, gold, nickel, alsic alloys, copper molybdenum, copper, copper molybdenum, gallium nitride. So you also have the ceramics, aluminum nitride, aluminum oxide, silicon, silicon carbide. So you can see that the materials they are completely different. So you have aluminum wire bonds that they have a large coefficient of thermal expansion and moderate thermal conductivity. And then you have other materials like aluminum oxide with very low thermal conductivity, thermal coefficient of thermal expansion of eight. And then you have your semiconductors, silicon carbide, high thermal conductivity, silicon. So you can see that some Materials are met, better, met, uh, match. they have a better, uh, better match. So you can see that aluminum oxide and aluminum nitride are ceramics. So aluminum nitride is, has a closer city to the semiconductor. Then you have the copper, aluminum. So that's also important for the wire bonds. So nickel, just the solder. So different layers to have the solderable 
backside metallization. So I think that this is a nice figure to show the different elements that appear on the packaging. Now key for power dissipation is that what's, what happens with how do you remove the heat? So if you want to remove the heat, there's a there's thermal, uh, something called thermal resistance that is the way that the package opposed to that heat being transferred from one point to other. So key here is the power dissipation the case temperature and the junction temperature. The junction temperature, as the temperature, thermal resistance is junction to case, it's just the temperature on the chip, and the case temperature is the outer temperature of the package. So the variation of temperature between those two points is just the power dissipated times the thermal resistance between these two points. So if you know your thermal resistance and your power, you may define your maximum junction temperature limit. So you don't want to go beyond the manufacturer limit. If they say 150 degrees, 175, you have to keep that junction temperature within the maximum limits. Also, this is for steady state. There are transient power pulses, and this is when it's important to define the thermal impedance with this uh, transient. It's like having thermal capacitance, the role of thermal capacitances and thermal resistances. So we can model that. So let's analyze how we model the thermal impedance. So the case is similar to the electrical impedance. L yeah. So assuming that you have different material layers, like this case, we have a stack of three different materials, and we assume one dimensional heat flow. Each material layer will have its cross section, thickness, and then the material properties are a specific density, a specific thermal conductivity and a specific heat capacity. So they define the thermal resistance and thermal capacitance of these layers. So you can see that if you increase your thickness, you're going to increase your thermal resistance. If you increase your area, you're going to reduce your thermal resistance. In both cases, you increase the thermal capacitance. And this is highly relevant if you consider chips. So what happens if you have a thicker chip on also a smaller chip. So if you have a smaller chip, your thermal resistance is going to increase. So that's highly relevant when you compa compare silicon carbide and silicon. Now, as you have different materials, it's important to check how the model of the heat flow is going to perform. So there are different model representations. One is the Cower network. It's also called continued fraction circuit, T-model, ladder network. And you have different layers, and each layer is defined by a capacitor and a cap thermal capacitance and thermal resistance. That this represents the thermal physical configuration of the device. So you have four layers. So each layer has its own thermal resistance and thermal capacitance, and the packaging materials, they define that. So if this is the chip, then solder, copper, whatever you have in your packaging structure and each RC level represents a material layer. So you can have the intermediate temperatures, you can have the junction temperature, you can have the temperature on the solder, you may have the temperature on the copper substrate. That's one good thing of the cover networks that if you know what's your packaging structure, you can define your thermal resistances and capacitances. Other representation for one, assuming one dimensional heat flow is the Foster network. It's also called partial fraction circuit or P model. So key here is that it does not represent the physical model of the packaging. It's just a mathematical tool that matches the transient thermal response. So you check in this case, this is how the thermal resistances and capacitances are connected. And this is how you calculate the thermal impedance. It's just as the sum of the different <coughs> elements contributing with a time constant defined by each layer, so thermal resistance and thermal capacitance. Now the first question that you will have is that the RC elements are different in the Cower and Foster network. So they are not the same. If you, you can make a transformation between the Cower and Foster, but they are not the same values. And it's important that the transient thermal response of the junction temperature is the same. But this 
values they are they don't represent any physical structure so this is not they don't define internal temperatures while this define they in the cover they define in intermediate temperatures on the packaging structure so concluding with this our network model is physically correct representing a physical model of the package so you know your package you can model your covered network so you know this is my chip this is my solder thickness this is my dvc substrate and you know your materials you can define your cover network and each node can be identified as a point in the package then in the foster network the rc pairs can be swapped without affecting the tran transient thermal response but in the cover network if you change the rc pairs that causes a different thermal response this is like changing the layers of the packaging. Something that is now really important is quite a hot topic regarding power cycling. Is that there is a lot of new equipment that can perform advanced power cycling studies, and highly relevant on this for these studies are structure functions. So, what is a structure function? Structure function is just a special function that is obtained from the transient cooling and heating. They're just using mathematical transformations as a tool, mathematical tool, and uses thermal resistances and capacitances in the cover form to identify changes in the thermal structure of your module. And there are two types, that is the differential and cumulative structure functions. And this is, if you have been using power cycling equipment, probably you know about structure functions. If not, probably this is new for you. So let's see if I manage to explain this properly. So the differential structure function is defined as the derivative of the cumulative thermal capacitance with respect to the cumulative thermal resistance. So you start from the chip, and you, as you are increasing the thermal resistance as you get out from the center of the chip, you have a you have the derivative of the capacitance respect to the thermal resistance. So you have a new interface in the heat flow path this will be a peak in the differential structure function because you are changing these parameters so this is done using that special equipment characterization you can see the different peaks so probably chip solder copper and then they are going to the heat sink that is just a shot key diode in TO247 so you can identify the different Inter in material interfaces. And this is just the differential structure function. Now analyze now the cumulative structure function. This is just the representation of the sum of the thermal capacitances. Sorry, thermal capacitances as a function of the thermal resistances. So it's like a discretized cover network. And it's linked to the real structure of the package with a change of material represented by a change of slope. So it's like you have capacitance resistances so it's like the discretized cover network and this is just the same shot key diode uh, is characterized so we have the cumulative structure functions and these are highly relevant for power cycling and as we will show later on so i have a question here that is you have used structure functions if you were aware of this concept so i have some recommendations if you want to read more about packaging and fundamentals so there's a chapter in this book regarding packaging which is a really good chapter and they explain things in detail and also the semicron application manual in power semiconductors is also an open access book that has a good section on packaging let's now go into the important stuff probably what i consider that is quite important is how what happens if you want to package silicon carbide and how it compares with silicon? It's just a general overview, but I think there are some good insights there. So packaging was developed for silicon devices. So what happens if we just replace the silicon chips with silicon carbide chips? So the first observation is that chip sizes are different. So I just selected chips for different from different manufacturers, same blocking voltage, 1200 volts. And different current ratings but on the same range so the first thing that you will observe is that the thickness is different so silicon IGBTs are thinner than silicon carbide MOSFETs it's not a lot but if you check the percentage it's quite high so 40 microns over 
140, so we're talking about 30%, more or less. And then key is the chip size. So just compare the 98 amps silicon carbide MOSFET with the 100 amps silicon IGBT. So you're comparing a device that is 4 by 6 with a device that is 12 by 11. So the chip area at 100 amps, the silicon IGBTs, they are 5.1 times larger. So what happens with diodes? Again, the same exercise, 1200 volts, 50 amps. So still silicon carbide devices, they are thicker. So 30 microns, extra microns in thickness. And the chip sizes are slightly better balanced in the case of the diodes, but still the silicon pin is 1.65 times larger. And what will happen if you have a hybrid module, a silicon IGBT with a silicon carbide shot key? Let's assume that you have devices of similar ratings. So just check, you will have a silicon IGBT that is 82 square millimeters and 140 micrometers and a silicon carbide shot key that is three to four times smaller in area and that is two to three times thicker so these material properties they will affect and sizes they you have different material properties different sizes they will affect the stresses on the packaging so silicon carbide chips they have different size smaller size and silicon carbide chips, they have different thermomechanical properties. So let's analyze what happens with these thermomechanical properties. So you can see that silicon carbide, it has higher thermal conductivity. The specific heat capacity is similar. CT is higher, so this should be closer to the DVC ceramic CT. But the key here is that the Young's modulus is three times larger. Young's modulus is just a way of measuring the stiffness of your material. So if you have a material that is stiffer and thicker, what will happen is that your stresses on your shoulder is probably going, they are probably going to be higher. So that's important to evaluate. So experimental results on IGBTs, they report that increasing the thickness of the IGBT chip reduces the temperature cycling capability. So we can see that voltage rating is related to thickness. And there are some finite element modeling studies that were done here analyzing different semiconductors with the same solder. It was silicon and silicon carbide. And it was shown that the thickness, that reducing the thickness of the chip increases the lifetime. So if you increase your thickness, you are going to reduce your lifetime on the solder. So from the point of view of comparing silicon and silicon carbide, you are going to have different stresses from that from that point. But what happens now if you just check the size? So we did some studies using finite element modeling. We just use a, the same substrate, pure copper, like a TO220, same solder, and we just replace the chip. So from the point of view of the stresses on the solder, you can see these are measured along this the edge of the chip. So you can see that the stresses from misses stresses on the silicon carbide die, they are higher than the stress on the silicon chip. So it, it will mean that your stresses on the solder are going to be higher. That probably will mean lower power cycling capability, more stresses, higher reduced reliability. So these different properties of silicon carbide and silicon were one of the initial challenges for developing packaging suitable for silicon carbide MOSFETs. Some people have already reported as well that the stresses on the solder were higher and the lifetime was reduced. And to me, this is very important that tests have to be done using silicon carbide dyes. And that means those tests can be expensive. So you want to evaluate a new packaging alternative if you want to say that this packaging alternative is good for silicon carbide, you have to do those tests with silicon carbide. They may be really good for silicon, and then when you apply that, apply that with silicon carbide, the results are not the same. So you have, if you want to test packaging alternatives, new solders that you uh, for using them in silicon carbide, you have to do your tests in silicon carbide. You can use dummy dyes, but they have to be silicon carbide chips. So question now is that if you were aware of these challenges of packaging, developing packaging methods for silicon carbide. 
So we have done also some modeling, uh, paper, a collaborative paper with different people from different universities, and consists in extrapolating results from power cycling silicon IGBTs to silicon carbide devices. So it's a finite element modeling that in the case of silicon, we it was calibrated with some experimental results, which are easy to, easy to obtain. And there are plenty of results there and models. And we decided to evaluate if we can extrapolate those results to silicon carbide. So we create a, two identical models, one with a silicon carbide chip, one with a silicon IGBT chip. And we just applied power cycling. So we just defined to have the same junction excursions. And as this finite element modeling, you can calculate the foamy stress, creep strain, creep energy. And it's quite clear that the stresses in the case of the silicon carbide chip, they are larger. Creep strain is also larger and creep energy. So analyzing the number of cycles to failure using a calibrated model, you can see that the lifetime using the simulation is reduced for the silicon carbide chip. And it's in a ratio for delta T's of 90 degrees, it's around 60% lower. And as you increase, it's, it's closer, but it's still 80 to 85% lower. So finite element tools are quite useful for understanding the stresses on the packaging and different elements compare materials. But you don't have to worry. I mean, there have been improvements. So packaging for silicon carbide, people know they want to use silicon carbide. So people have been working on developing good packaging methodologies for silicon carbide. So using sintering materials, sintered silver, sintered copper, new solder materials, things that are suitable for silicon carbide. And recent investigations, they report improved temperature cycling capability. So here they were reporting really good power cycling results and they have a uh, improved backside metallization and sintered silver. So if you check the latest research publications, people are working into good packaging alternatives for silicon carbide devices. So let's analyze now what's the key of power cycling and how the package degrades and what we can learn from that. So it's important to highlight that there is there are two techniques. One is power cycling and one is temperature cycling. In temperature cycling, the variation of temperature is external. So you use a thermal chamber. You put your module, your device in the chamber and you just cycle the temperature up and down. And you just have stresses because of this variation of temperature, heating and cooling your module. However, in power cycling, you use the power loss dissipation on the chip to subject the chip to temperature excursions. And you require a power cycling electrical circuit, uh, like the basic one in this figure. So you just have a device under test, you have a heating current that is controlled with an auxiliary device, and a sensing current that is used for measuring the junction temperature. You have an auxiliary diode to decouple both supplies, because you don't want current to flow between them. So you can see a timing sequence here. So when your auxiliary device is on, you have current flowing through the device and the junction temperature rises. And when you switch off your auxiliary device, you can use the sensing current to monitor the voltage drop across the diode. And you can see how the temperature of the device reduces. You can monitor the cooling. The stresses on the packaging are due to the coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch, as we have shown previously. And this is how you define your test. Key here is that you want to they are accelerated lifetime tests. So you want to evaluate the number of temperature cycles until failure. So you just define a delta T variation of temperature and you want to see how long does it the device to go beyond a threshold in failure that can be 20% increase of the on state voltage thermal resistance. So important will be that you have to define the failure mechanisms. You have to understand what happens there, what is going to happen during power cycling. It's going to be solder degradation, wire bond lift off, and the mechanisms that will accelerate that degradation. Remember that this is accelerated. You don't want to spend 20 years at nominal operation to see if your package survives. So you accelerate. So you're going to subject your devices to accelerated lifetime tests. 
but they are still time consuming. It can take months to years, depending on the parameters that you want to analyze, number of devices. And key will be determine the number of cycles to failure as a function of some parameters, like the Janssen temperature excursion. So lifetime for a delta T of 80 degrees, 120, 200 at mean temperature. So what happens if your mean temperature is 60, 80, 100? And also what's the role of fast and slow cycling times? Is the same cycling one second on, one second off, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, different currents. So that's important to define. That's imp important to define these parameters to get the number of cycles to failure in different er scenarios. And different models have been proposed that take these parameters into consideration. In the 90s, there was a project in Germany, the Lessit project, that was a, uh, defined for evaluating the lifetime of IGBT power modules. And the number of cycles to failure was characterized for different values of junction temperature excursions and mean temperatures. The results were presented in this conference paper, it was a traction application. And it's just the number of, fail of cycles to failure follows a coffin manson model with an Arrhenius term. So you can see that you have the delta T and the mean temperature, and this will just give you the number of cycles to failure. There, however, there are more parameters, and this model was improved and extended. So in 2008, an extended lifetime model was presented at the SIPS conference. It's a conference in packaging. It takes place in Germany. And this model is called the SIPS 2008. And it's a more complex model. So additional parameters that influence the lifetime of power modules were evaluated. So they include the minimum injunction temperature, the heating time, the rated voltage of the chip. So that's mainly the thickness the diameter of the wire bonds and the current per wire bond. So it's just a more complex model with a lot of different beta parameters and K, which are experimentally obtained. So just for best matching. Yeah, I would like to highlight the heating time is related to the time, uh, to the heating time constant. So uh, short heating time, you're going to stress your chip and if you want um, wire bonds, so fast cycling, but if you are going to long cycling times, you let the heat go from the chip to the inner layers of the packaging. So that is going, going to reach the substrate solder. So depending on the what you want to evaluate, which mechanisms you want to check, you define your heating times. So this is just what the results look like. So this is the results from the less it probably you are, have worked on this you will have seen this already. So they just have different curves for mean temperatures of 60, 80, and 100, and they evaluated at a different delta Ts. So you can see that if you increase your mean temperature, you reduce the number of cycles to failure. And if you increase your delta T, you reduce the number of cycles to failure. If you reduce delta T, they should increase. So it's just something the manufacturers, they give this Let's see results for power, power cycling for different delta Ts. So you can apply this to your converters and your converter design. So I have also another question here. If you have used this kind of lifetime predictions in your converter designs. But now key is if you want to define your power cycling test and do you want them to be accurate. So something important is that if your delta T junction temperature is a input, you have to ensure that these temperature excursions are controlled and they are well defined. So if you say that this device survives uh, 1000 cycles, 10,000 cycles, 1 million cycles at a delta T of 100 degrees, you have to be sure that all of them were 100 degrees. So you can use temperature sensitive electrical parameters or you can use temperature sensors like fiber optic sensors, thermal cameras. This is a good option for power cycling. Also, you would like to monitor the electrical parameters during the test, like the on-state voltage. You would like to see how the thermal resistance impedance degrades. And this can help you to define health monitoring strategies. If you know how the power module degrades, that's a good precursor for implementing health monitoring online. How do you use a TSP during power cycling? So you know that the heating current is easy to see. Yes. 
keep the device using the heating current, but the use of TSPs, it requires calibration. So in the case of the IGBT and diode, it's just the on-state voltage at low current. So you just measure the on-state voltage at different temperatures. And you can see how the on-state voltage reduces with temperature for both the on-state voltage of the silicon carbide shot key and a silicon IGBT. So you can use this as a temperature sensor. So when you remove the heating current, you know, the other sensing current, you can identify the junction temperature because you have your calibration curve. So how you do this? So you can identify the peak tension temperature and the cooling transient. Let's analyze when you don't have when you have only the sensing current, you have a voltage that is equivalent to the thermometer, it's just your TSEP. When you apply the heating current, your on state voltage is high. And then when you just remove the heating uh, the heating current, so you have only the sensing current again. Uh, if your device your temperature has increased, your your TSP has reduced, and then as it cools down, it goes back to the initial state. So we have some measurements here for a silicon carbide shot kit diode, a four seconds heating pulse, and pulses of one amp, three amps, and five amps. So you can see this is just this transient. You can see for one amp, the heating is negligible, very low heating. So it cools down quite fast. If you increase the current, three amps, so you can start seeing that dip caused by self-heating. And if you have the five amps pulse, you can see how there's a big change of the forward voltage that represents the maximum junction temperature. And then you can see how the, temp the junction cools after heat removal. So we have done different pulses at different currents. And you can see, let's analyze five amps heating current. For one second, you get a junction temperature increase of 80 degrees. You know your TSP before the pulse, so you, it's easy to calculate the temperature increase, it's just delta Bf. And then for two, uh, two second pulse, you increase more even the temperature, and for a four second pulse, and at five amps, your junction temperature increase is even higher. So you can do that for different pulses, and you can calculate the different junction temperature scores resulting from that heating pulse. Also, how do you monitor the degradation? This is a nice trick that I will have done here. Sorry, just to show the, what's the role of the higher thermal resistance. So we evaluated this using two devices. One is in the same package. So the same device in different packages, sorry. One is in a standard TO220 with a traditional copper backside with low thermal resistance, and one is packaging an insulated, fully isolated TO220. So you can see the is fully covered in plastic. So the thermal resistance is high. So what will happen if we apply the same pulse to which is the same device in different package structures? So you can see that this is just the cooling for a heating pulse of five amps on four seconds. So you can see how the peak tension temperature for the isolated device is higher. So a reduced BF after heat current removal and how the cooling transient is different. So you can see how the standard device, this slope is higher. It's higher so this device cools faster than the other device that they isolated. We have done the same test for one second heating pulses and four second heating pulses at different currents. And you can see how the <clears throat> temperature is always higher for the isolated device. You can also monitor the degradation during the test. You can use thermal, thermal resistance is going to increase due to solder voids and cracks. So they increase the thermal resistance. You can see at zero cycles, everything was properly attached and not a lot of voids. And then as you increase the, it's an open access paper where you can check all the data. After 13,000 cycles, you can see how the attachment is not as good. So this will be reflected as an increase of thermal resistance. You can do a scanning acoustic microscope tomography or X-ray tomography at different intervals, like they have done here. Or you can also characterize the thermal resistance at determined intervals during the test. Key for 
characterizing the thermal resistance is that you require a steady state, you require a defined pulse. So you need to know what's the power that you're going to apply, take the device to a steady state, calculate case, and junction temperatures. The on state voltage, what happens with the on state voltage? Usually that can be measured at high current during the heating phase. Not that wire bonds are going to be damaged during power cycling. So you're going to see some steps on the measured collector emitter voltage that they are the result of wire bond lift off. So every time that a wire bond is broken or is not connected, so that means that your resistance is increasing. So you have less wire bonds in parallel. And this is just represented as a step on the collector emitter voltage. So depending on the number of wire bonds, this step is going to be higher or not. So you can check that in this website when they are presenting lifetime and power cycling from IGBT. And now, this is where I would like to highlight why structure functions have been so popular and this power cycling equipment has been so successful because they allow you to observe the layering where the degradation is happening. So you can characterize the structure function at different points during the test. And as you know, each peak represents a different layer, a change of layer in the material. So you can see, okay, the solder is degrading here. So you can see how it's increasing. And also you can see in the, uh, the other, in the case, so you can see how the degradation is happening and you can see a change on the thermal resistance. So this is why this you have way more information than just having the total thermal resistance. So you just manage to get the total thermal resistance. You will just go back to this and you will just see, okay, my thermal resistance is increasing, but you don't know where the failure is. If you use structure functions, you can see exactly where the failure is happening within the package. You mean you will have to know all the structure and calibrate that properly, but I think it's an interesting way of evaluating failure during power cycling. So just to conclude this, I'm linking to the next webinar. Power cycling of a silicon carbide shot key diode is straightforward. So you just have a diode, you calibrate your TSEP, and you can just measure temperature and calibrate and identify your number of cycles to failure, everything is there. But what happens if you want to do power cycling of silicon carbide MOSFETs? Is BTI a factor to consider during power cycling? Is BTI affecting also conditioning, condition monitoring? Yes, the gate oxide and threshold voltage shifts are going to affect power cycling and condition monitoring during all the operation. Can we use the body diode as TSEP during power cycling of silicon carbide MOSFETs? Can we uh, apply TSEPs for condition monitoring in silicon carbide MOSFETs properly? Do, is there any concern that we have to address? So that will be covered in the next webinar. And this just concludes this webinar. So it's just going to conclude and acknowledge support. So in this webinar, we have studied the fundamentals of power electronics packaging. We have shown the role of the parasitic elements of the packaging. We have presented 1D thermal models, Cowan and Foster. We presented the role of the structure function in packaging. We have evaluated and compared the difference between silicon and silicon carbide regarding packaging. And we have given an overview of power cycling and packaging degradation. So I would like to acknowledge collaborators. This was done during my PhD. So it was collaborating with different people. So starting from Professor Laya Latisse. Um, with Professor Phil Moby, so you can check the names of the collaborators here. And I would like to thank the UKRA for giving the, me the opportunity to present in this webinar. And I would like to thank the previous funders of the research. And this just concludes the webinar that I hope that you enjoyed. Fantastic. Thank you, Jose. That was an excellent uh, overview of semiconductor packaging. Um, we don't actually have any questions on the on the live poll as of yet. So um, to, to the people in the audience, please do enter any questions you do have just whilst um, we give people a chance to do that. Um, maybe, Jose, um, we, we briefly discussed this on, on this morning's webinar. Um, uh, and the point being, uh, when we move to these advanced wideband gap powered semiconductor devices, we're typically seeing the performance level we can achieve 
from a smaller physical die and you, you alluded to that in your presentation today so do you um do you foresee a, a bit of a fundamental limit and a conflict coming up between the progression to why bang gap semiconductors and our ability to cool them um properly uh, for the same power for the same power dissipation levels or do the wide band gap devices have to get incrementally better as the die becomes smaller to manage the thermostat? Uh, I would say that's a good question and that's also a tricky question because if you make your converters smaller, you're going to increase your, what's the name, your power density. Mm. And removing heat from small things, that's always complicated. Yeah. So you don't have that large heat sink area that you can apply there. You don't have that massive fan that you can connect there. So mm you probably are going to have similar losses because if your losses are lower, probably you will decide, okay, I can dissipate more power. I'm going to make my, my converter more powerful. Mm. So managing thermal issues on small converters is always complicated. Yeah. Just from that point of view. So it's like, okay, even would you say that if you have a converter that is 10 times smaller, well, is the same heat sink going to be cooling method is going to be enough to cool down that converter or not? Do you have to improve your cooling system? Mm -hmm. That's a tricky question because power density matters a lot. I think that you are covering something like that in the next webinar. I mean, it's yeah. like going to an induct is going to an inductor. If a small inductor gets hot, it's really difficult to remove the heat from that inductor. Mm. So I would say the limit will be how fast you can remove the heat from your small converter. <laughs> yeah, because I guess also from a commercial standpoint, um, manufacturers of, of products will always attempt to push the maximum, push the devices to their maximum capability because that's what they want to do to, to add value to their product. Um, so I guess ultimately, we'll all, it doesn't matter how good the semiconductor material is that we put inside the package, Ultimately, we will always have a thermal limitation in our design and th thermal design and thermal requirements will always ultimately govern the performance of our system. It's just the, I guess, the benchmark and the level we can achieve is incrementally improving over time. But ultimately, all of these things boil down to thermal design. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I always discuss when I have students, project students. Mm. So they get a device, the discrete, and just let me show the camera. Again, so they just get a device, TO247, TO220, yeah. whatever it is, and they check, okay, power dissipation, 180 watts. Yeah. They say, great, this device can dissipate 180 watts. But this device can dissipate 180 watts, 200 watts, if you manage to keep the case temperature at 25 degrees. Exactly. Yeah. And the manufacturer doesn't tell you how to keep that case temperature at 25 degrees. <laughs> yeah. So that's the tricky thing of power electronics converter and management. I mean, it's like probably you have your converter and you think, okay, I can apply this and I can put 100 amps and switch at 100 kilohertz, which is great. But then the moment when you start switching, suddenly, okay, you start seeing a smell, seeing, you start seeing smoke and you yeah. start feeling that smell there. And then, okay, but what happened here? And it's that, that you didn't manage to remove the heat as fast as you should. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think the other the other um, aspect of this is when you start thinking about um, maybe uh, as power electronics pushes out into the grid type application, you know, if you look at a, a, a 50 hertz line frequency transformer, it has a huge amount of thermal mass. So it, it's transient power capability is probably significantly higher than its continuous rated power capability because it's just got thermal mass. It's like the thermal capacitance you had in your models earlier. But when you're yeah. looking physical um power electronic converters unless they're designed specifically to do it their their peak or, or, or their, their peak power capability is pro capability is probably going to be far more limited than that sort of that that sort of mechanical large transformer yeah i mean oh I think there's a question there let's see Okay, what do we have with the cash code? Most uh, cash code uh, is a cash code JFET. Do we have two junction temperatures or one to assess? Mm -hmm. I would say the the one that is dominant should be the JFET. So probably the JFET is going to be eighty to ninety percent of the total losses. So the MOSFET you can 
should be a low voltage MOSFET, probably 20 to 30 volts MOSFET, and the, the on-state losses are going to be minimum. Mm. So probably that device is just a few milliohms compared with 70, 80 milliohms, probably. Mm. It shouldn't affect. It, you may have different issues as you have additional wire bonds, additional robustness techniques. So what happens in a short circuit of a cash code? So you remove the issues with the gate, but probably you will have different things to consider. And I guess also, Jose, the low voltage MOSFET will be a lot faster, have much faster switching transitions than the high voltage MOSFET as well. So from a switching loss perspective, it's really going to be the, 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 the JFET that dominates. Yeah, I mean, it's a normal, but it's still a normally on device. So the mm. effects are quite fast regarding mm. that. So, yeah. But that's an interesting question which one has more losses? I mean, if you consider conduction losses, it should be really low. And then the device, the one that dominates the switching transients, is the high, blo high blocking voltage device. Mm. So losses should be dominated by the silicon carbide jfet yeah that's an excellent question actually it's 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 in a similar vein it's um it it moves us on to the considerations of thermal management in a system you know when people um typically look at a large aluminium heat sink, it has a thermal impedance of some parameter but actually if you put a power semiconductor device right in the middle of it you'll have a transit so you'll have a um a distribution of heat as you move away from that device, you'll have a hot spot. So actually, when you start looking into the details of real thermal management and packaging, you have to, uh, as that question indicates, you have to start looking in detail at the, the different parts in the system and physically where they sit. Um, and on Thursday this week, we're going to be talking about thermal management. And one of the areas uh, uh, that, that Jose has done a good job introducing today is thermal management in um in, in semiconductor packaging um, and it's, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff uh, that, 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 that needs to be thought about if you're going to come up with a reliable design. Uh, also, I would like to highlight something that is here. We are just considering one single chip. So what happens when you have chips in parallel, then they have different degradation, which is highly relevant for silicon carbide. And what happens when you have a converter? When you have, let's say, a six inverter that you have six chips, um, probably six diodes. That what the, what's going to happen there? So what happens with the power factor? So is the, if the temperature is balanced, some people are saying that in some modules there is a temperature sensor that gives you the case temperature, but if you want the temperature of the different chips, that can be affected. Mm, absolutely. Okay, there is a interesting question there. Can micro holes on the package improve the thermal performance? Mm. I am not sure about that. So if you make holes, that makes sense from the point of view of the PCB that you want to solder and have current, at the same time, current and heat transfer. But if you start adding micro holes in the copper of the, um, that's a tricky question. I mean, you can probably improve the heat flow if you have some kind of micro holes and you have more air flowing and that stuff, depending on how you're going to have that. But you may also have, what's the name, issues because you are removing your area. So if you remove your contact area, you are increasing the thermal resistance. Mm. Also, to, to the, the, the person who, who put that question up, if you have any information or papers or anything like that that you you know that, that that support your, your your question there please do put them up because we're always open to um any new information if the you know if there's evidence out there that micro holes in the package can improve thermal performance we're very very open to, to to hearing about it i mean i understand that in the point of view of pcbs so imagine that you have soldered your voltage regulator any chip that you soldered to your pcb and you have just a copper tab if you solder that you have a, co a copper tab on top so that's your area. But now imagine that you have a lot of micro holes that are connecting to the bottom side copper. So you may have, if the heat transfer is good, you may have two areas of copper that you are transferring the heat. So a lot of people are working on that for, let's see, for gallium nitride devices, because gallium nitride, they are PCB mounted devices. So heat management is quite important. So they, a lot of them know they are they have a top 
setup for thermal management, how to attach the heatsink, that's a different story. I mean, if you think about uh, power modules, it's just well known. You put your power module, heatsink, put a fan, put a water-cooled system. But what happens with discrete devices <laughs> mm. that are really small and compact? But the yeah. micro, micro holes. OK, there's a question there, mutual. Just whilst you're you're thinking about that next question that that, that comes in, Jose, I think yeah. um, it's worth pointing out just from an experienced perspective, um, often that the requirements for wide band gap devices in terms of driving them the low, the low inductance packaging and all that sort of all those sorts of requirements can start to conflict with the, or, or create challenges for the thermal management at the same time because you know for good thermal management you want stuff to have a nice big surface area and you you know if you put a heat sink on something it's quite difficult to get the drive circuitry and everything else close you end up with this sort of um really concentrated piece of circuit where you're trying to manage loop inductances thermal management all in the same place and it's quite a it's it's quite a challenge to get all of that to work and you you end up just with a trade-off of balancing all of those different competing requirements yeah and what you were the insulating capacitances so your base plate is connected to ground <laughs> Yeah. You may have issues with current going through the to the heat sink and that stuff. You may also have EMI. Mm. So do you want do you want do you want really small things or not that small? Mm. I mean, you don't want large things because you can have antennas on your design <laughs> and loops. But then, do you do you want really small things there that you cannot remove your heat at all? Mm. So going to that, yeah, I mean. How they are coping the cash code, the JFET and that stuff can be interesting, especially checking the safe operating area. Yeah, I mean, they are devices that are brand new, well brand. If you check the manufacturers, they are making a reinforced publicity now. I think they don't have the gate oxide issues, so, but a lot of things they have to be tested. Yeah, I guess that's the point here, isn't it? For those sorts of Casco devices, they would, they would, to qualify them as a device, they would. I'm sure there there must be some JDEC specs around the sort of testing that would um, that would be done on that. So this comment about the um, the low voltage device safe operating area um, being impacted by the JFET loss, I think that would probably they the 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 the, the, the the approvals process for the device would probably have to take all of that into account. Otherwise, otherwise you end up with an unreliable device and, and nobody wants that. I mean, I cannot comment on that. I don't know. Who, I mean, I know that there are cash, uh, silicon carbide hemps and there are also, what's the name, gun hemps, and they have their own benefits and reliability concerns. So, I mean, it's like, what's going to happen? You have a device that is attached to a DBC and you have different wire bonds, is there going to be, the, to me, the case? The case is going to be the same, same temperature. If your case gets really hot, what happens with the silicon MOSFET? If you have 80, 90 degrees, you are not probably not supposed to have that temperature there. What happens if the wire bonds start to detach? And what happens if you have wire bond? You are adding more complexity. You have a DBC within a TO247. I would say they are brilliant devices if you check the properties. But again, the more complex complex things that you add is more mm. things you have to manage. It's like a intelligent <coughs> power module. You have your gate drives within the package. But what happens if your power module gets hotter? Mm. Usually, if you consider your designs, your gate driver is out of the package. So your, your gate driver is not getting hot. What happens now if your gate driver is getting hot and your gate driver is not at 30, 40 degrees, it's, it's at 120 degrees. Mm. So I haven't seen a lot of publications on that, what happens from the point of view of high temperature gate drivers. So that kind of thing can be interesting to evaluate, especially if you are going into packaging integration. Yeah. And a, and a similar thing, I think some, some manufacturers have experimented and probably are selling um, power semiconductor packages, modules, where they have these ceramic capacitors embedded actually within the module. I'm sure I've seen that. Um, yeah. And there were some questions. Um, obviously, it's a great thing to do for decoupling because you're taking that capacitor and putting it as close as physically you can to the device, which is fantastic. 
the problem is obviously you're then exposing that capacitor that, to high temperature yeah, <laughs> depending on the dielectric and the you know the uh, how it performs with temperature you then create a challenge potentially for reliability so this whole th thermal design is one of the biggest challenge well it, it's totally what what affects reliability in your system design um and, and anytime you put Component, other components closer and closer to that heat source, they just end up operating hotter uh, at higher temperatures. So that has to be taken into account from a reliability perspective. Absolutely. Yeah, but I mean, just to clarify this, this is just digression. We are just talking yeah. our hypothesis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, just assuming that this is not. I mean, people have to test that, but I would say if you put some things that are going to be at high temperatures, it's like going to outer space. So things can be at 80 if you have things in a satellite. If the satellite is exposed to the sun, probably the temperature there is going to be massive mm. all, for all the devices. If they are, when it's cold, that's going to be really cold. <laughs> yeah. I also, guess in those applications, I guess they use specialist bonding materials and all sorts yeah. of things to, do, to, to, to avoid the reliability issues. Ah, but it's the same if you go to EV chargers. It's not the same on EV charger in let's see in the desert mm. that in the north of sweden yeah. <laughs> so if you're going to have minus 30 degrees even canada if you're going to have converters operating outside at minus 15 minus 20 degrees or you're going to have things in the south of spain mm. at 50 degree in the sun <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, well, we'll be going into details of thermal design on, on Thursday. So if you've not registered for that and you'd be interested, please do sign up. Um, we've, I think, finished your questions now. So, Jose, is there anything you would like to finish uh, up? No, yes. Thanks for attending. And hopefully see you in the next one. Hope you enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Jose. And thank, thanks for thanks. attending, everybody. Bye-bye.